Namaste. My name is Stephanie from Apex Languages and Gapanova School, and this is Weekly Wordplay. Over the past couple of months, we've journeyed through space and time to investigate important milestones in the history of English. And today, I'm going back about as far as one can to explore the relationship between our language and the ancient yet still relevant tongue of Sanskrit, which puts the Indo in Indo-European along with a jungle of other words like juggernaut. Everyone complains about how hard it is to learn English, because it is, but that's not really English's fault. Learning any language is difficult. There's no hardest or easiest language. They're all just different. The only easy language is the one or ones you grew up speaking. That said, I do like to give my Spanish and Portuguese and even Russian speakers a little perspective now and then, reminding them that they still have it a lot easier than others. Those languages all belong to what is known as the Indo-European family of languages, the largest group spoken today by about 46% of all people. So, while at quick glance you may say that English and, say, Persian are nothing alike, they don't even use the same alphabet. We do share a similar understanding of how grammar works at a basic level, a love of inflectional affixes, think verb conjugations, and vocabulary with some shared origins. That is very different from the subtle tonal vowels of Chinese, the fickle infixes of Arabic, and the mile long tell an entire story in one word verbs of indigenous Amerindian persuasion. Of course, all languages share some common ground because at the end of the day, we are all human. So the next time you get frustrated at how strange, random, and baffling English is, take a moment and try to focus instead on what it actually has in common with your native tongue. Starting, of course, with the fact that your language makes other learners cry as well. In order to celebrate the beautiful diversity of our extended family tree, today I've chosen to focus on Sanskrit, which originated more than 3,500 years ago as the sacred language of Hinduism, making it older than Latin, Hebrew, Chinese, and even ancient Greek. It is most famous as the language of the Vedas. Nonetheless, more than 3,000 modern Sanskrit works have been written since India's independence in 1947 alone, so it is far from dead. Pretty impressive, especially considering that it has to compete in a country with 21 other official languages and possibly more than 1,600 dialects. Beyond obvious spiritual terms like guru, yoga, and karma, a few more common words that we use today in English range from the luxurious and exotic, ruby, cashmere, and candy, to the mundane essentials of everyday life, like rice, orange, and shampoo. Now let's take a look at a couple of words you're probably a little less familiar with, though, starting with juggernaut. Say that with me, juggernaut. In the original Sanskrit, it referred to everything that moves, the world, all men and beasts. In Hindi, it was used as one of many titles of the great god Krishna, Lord of the World, and later applied particularly to a huge wagon bearing his image. According to legend, this wagon was used in an annual festival during which the faithful would willingly throw themselves before it and allow themselves to be crushed to death in sacrifice. Not true, but it does certainly explain how juggernaut came into our language referring to anything requiring blind devotion and cruel sacrifice, or more generally, any large destructive force, for example, war, nuclear bombs, dictators, or a little more lightheartedly, maybe a sports team on a winning streak. Juggernauts may not seem all that threatening at first, 
but the consequences of getting on their bad side and possibly even on their good side could be devastating most of us don't give gas a second thought for example but it was apparently important enough to go to war for and sacrifice our soldiers fortunately gasoline is not the juggernaut it once was now that electric cars are taking over what else will replace it i wonder a pundit would be glad to tell you pundits were highly respected learned men in hindu culture especially ones well versed in sanskrit lore science law and religion the term entered english with similarly high credentials referring to any expert or authority who was called upon to make comments or pass judgment but it's been dragged through the mud a little bit since then you're most likely to find modern pundits not in a library or university but on your television screen reporting the news or commenting on sports these are not people that we always show the utmost respect for especially when we don't like what they have to say the pundits froze on screen not knowing what to say after their teleprompter unexpectedly busted some might even consider pundits and definitely juggernauts to be thugs thugs which comes from a sanskrit verb suggesting concealment for cunning yet fraudulent activities in the early 1800s it leapt into international usage as the name of a gang in india renowned for strangling their victims ever since we've used it to describe violent lawless vicious people aka criminals especially those who go in for the more serious crimes of assault robbery or murder it can be used more generally for anyone who just looks like they might murder you too like a bully or a hooligan i don't like the look of those thugs over there are you sure we're safe in this neighborhood if they're good at stealing thugs may end up with a lot of loot loot sanskrit loptram was the indian version of plunder booty aka stolen property the kind pillaged from people's houses during wartime nowadays we use it as both a noun and a verb similar to plunder to refer both to the act of stealing and to the things you get as a result or you can just use it to talk about anything valuable no crime necessary as in our next sentence the children couldn't wait to see what loot they'd get for christmas they may not have robbed a bank themselves but it sure feels like it finally i present you with tank a little word with a lot of definitions it principally refers to a large container for holding liquids or gas mainly water and that makes sense because it originally meant pond or lake in sanskrit especially that meant for irrigation or drinking water tanks tend to be on the larger side they're great for storing your pet fish and it's also what you call the back of your toilet where all the water is stored to tank can mean to put or store in a tank but it took on the more popular albeit slang implication of failure ever since a 1967 interview with tennis star billy jean king accusing men of always giving up or tanking it makes sense if you think about falling into a tank and failing to get out before you drown the other major definition is an armored combat vehicle as seen here and that makes much less sense what do armored tanks have to do with ponds it's a fun story actually the word was invented by the british in 1915 at the start of world war one the committee of imperial defense recommended that the proposed caterpillar machine gun destroyer machines they were planning on designing should be entrusted to an organization which for secrecy shall be called the tank supply committee they also considered making their fake cover company sell reservoirs or cisterns but monosyllable tank stuck and soldiers liked the name too roughly a year later when the beasts finally made their first appearance in combat so there you have it british intelligence hard at work 
And while that sinks in, I leave you with your sample sentence. The soldiers tanked by tanking the tank into the giant water tank. Thanks for sticking around. Sorry, but I've still got your idiom of the week and I've decided to go cow themed. Holy cow, right? Cow is in Sanskrit. It's actually Norse from our old friends, the Vikings. And holy is similarly Germanic in origin. We've been using holy to intensify a variety of phrases for almost 200 years, including such goodies as holy smoke, holy moly, and holy mackerel. Holy cow has been around since 1914, popularized by baseball pundits. It's an exclamation expressing shock or astonishment, just like saying, wow, or holy cow, I can't believe they did that. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? Good news, holy cow can be used for both. Have a cow and don't have a cow became very popular in the 1980s due to bad boy Bart Simpson, although he seems to have laid off the cows in recent decades. Still, don't lay a finger on his butterfinger. It means to become angry or worried, usually to the point of losing control and freaking out, as in, Oh no, the boss will have a cow when he finds out. The phrase actually originated in the 1950s and is equivalent to the British alternative, don't have kittens. I guess they must both be stressful pets. I know, once you get me talking about etymology, I may keep yapping until the cows come home. That means to go on forever and ever and ever and ever. This one is much older than the other two, appropriately, coming from the Scottish Highlands where their cattle were left to their own devices to graze for months at a time before making their own way back home every fall. Pretty well trained. Don't have a cow though, you don't actually need your own herd of cows to use this phrase nowadays. Watch, I'll use it again right now. You can keep arguing till the cows come home, but it won't change my mind. Holy cow, I think we're finally done. That is except for your practice, of course. Global warming and COVID look like they'll be the next big juggernauts of this decade, sowing chaos and destruction all over the place. And if we just ignore them, we'll probably be dealing with this pandemic until the cows come home. Although that won't be too long because the environment will kill us all first. Which do you think are expert pundits in government or thugs, depending on what you want to call them, should focus the majority of research investment into right now. In other words, what do you think should be the greatest priority? Think carefully. We're all counting on you and you alone not to tank this. No, I'm just joking. Don't have a cow. I hope you found some valuable loot rooting around my treasure trove of vocabulary. Stay happy, healthy, and safe. And thanks again for watching.